Welcome to Friends Congregational Church Sermons. We are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome and you belong. I'm Kristen Hibbets, and I'll be introducing this week's sermon. If you enjoy this podcast and you'd like to learn more about our ministries in College Station, Texas, take a look at our website, friends Dash ucc.org. Please enjoy this sermon, originally recorded in 2018, reflecting on Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34, with a message, The Heart of the Gospel, preached by our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Dan DeLeon. On this day of remembrance and honoring those who've gone on before us, they're in our hearts and minds as we turn that attention now to the Gospels. And so from the Gospel of Mark, I invite us to hear these words from the 12th chapter, starting at the 24th verse. One of the legal experts heard their dispute and saw how well Jesus answered them. He came over and asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus replied, the most important one is, Israel, listen, our God is the one Lord, and you must love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you will love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. The legal expert said to him, well said, teacher. You have truthfully said that God is one, and there is no one other than other besides him. And to love God with all of your heart, a full understanding, and all of one's strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more important than all kinds of entirely burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered him with wisdom, he said to him, You aren't far from God's kingdom. After that, no one dared ask him, any more questions? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for your still speaking word in our lives, even in this very moment. And we pray that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth would be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I don't know if you've heard, but it's election season again. <laughs> this is the last Sunday before the midterm election, so we should probably address that elephant in the middle of the room. Now, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. That would be illegal. And even if religious liberty were to skew in our favor, as it does for some religious communities and not for others these days, it would still be unethical. However... This message can't help but be political because the gospel message is political. That is, if we're going to understand politics in terms of the fundamental definition of it. Politics is the collective art of neighbors shaping our common life together. The collective art of neighbors shaping their common life together. And that is at the heart of the gospel. That's what the gospel is all about. It's not about me, but we. And the gospel message of Jesus Christ is the foundation of our faith. I don't know if any of you have heard of Bill Hicks. Bill Hicks was a comedian who was ahead of his time, who died far too early. He was raised Southern Baptist but later rejected the faith because of all the contradictions coming from Christian leaders that he just couldn't stomach. He worked that into his stand-up. Hicks thought it was hypocritical for Christians to say that eternal suffering awaited anyone who would question God's infinite love. In the 1980s, when Hicks was breaking through with stand-up comedy, he would call out Christians for blindly nodding along their agreement with televangelists who called for nuclear armament 
in the name of Jesus. One of his stand-up bits, Hicks, Hicks talks about being cornered by a small group of disgruntled people in the audience after he gets off stage, and they say to him, hey, we're Christian, and we don't like what you said. And he, he pauses and says, well, forgive me. <laughs> now, one might get defensive about what Bill Hicks said with that comeback. It's snarky, it's patronizing, but it's also prophetic. If we think about it, the heart of the gospel message says that we're supposed to love God with all that we are and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We're supposed to forgive others as we would want to be forgiven ourselves. We're supposed to help others in their time of need just as we would hope to have the same help extended to us when we're all of a sudden desperate. Have you ever been there? We're mandated to love others as we, all of us, just want to be loved. That's the collective art of neighbors shaping our common life together, and that's the heart of the gospel. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. There's a church in Illinois, First Congregational Church of Crystal Lake, where they say those words in unison at the start of every one of their worship services because it puts everything in context. Their children, by the time they get to kindergarten, they have all memorized those words from Jesus, because to their congregation, those words are everything. And whether we're making a decision this week about who to vote for, or making decisions next week about whether to send that angry email, or making decisions the week after that about how to spend and prioritize our time and our money, and then making decisions next month about the words that we will choose and the actions we will choose when interacting with our neighbors. Those words from Jesus are everything. Love is all that matters. Jesus has been the subject of a couple of heated disputes in this morning's text. And one of the disputes, people are trying to make Jesus position himself against the religious leaders. In another dispute, they're trying to get Jesus to look bad in the eyes of the Roman Empire, it's like he's in a town hall meeting being asked about everything from immigration to health care to his thoughts on kneeling during the national anthem. They're all trying to trap Jesus to make him discredit himself and to keep societal divisions intact in the process. But while they're hovering over Jesus like vultures waiting for something to die, a lawyer sees how Jesus handles everything. How he meets every dispute with patience and understanding. And the lawyer is drawn to that. He's pulled toward Jesus because when he hears Jesus speak, he sees a light in the darkness of insanity. That is what he's drawn toward. And when he reaches Jesus, the lawyer doesn't try to dispute him any further. He just asks him which commandment is the most important to all. And Jesus says, uh, two actually, love God with your whole self and love your neighbor as yourself. <sighs> no other commandment is greater than these. The lawyer affirms what Jesus says, and Jesus affirms the lawyer right back, telling him that he's not far from God's kingdom. Now why is this important? Notice that Jesus and the lawyer are two very different people from stereotypically opposed walks of life. Notice that after they affirm each other, the lawyer doesn't drop everything to follow Jesus, but Jesus wishes him well anyway. Notice that these two very different people speak from the foundation of their faith and say to each other, I see you. I feel you. We're good. And from that point, even though they don't walk together, they still walk alongside each other as neighbors. Neighbors who affirm each other. Neighbors who are at peace with each other. Neighbors who understand each other. Neighbors who love each other. They know that when they let their guard down, love is all that matters. 
You know the name Hillel. Hillel was a Jewish religious leader during antiquity who's regarded as a sage and a scholar in Judaism. And when he was asked what the greatest commandment was, he answered, What you hate for yourself, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole law. The rest is commentary. And in Islam, in the Hadith, a collection of the traditions and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad for our Muslim neighbors, it says, None of you has faith until he loves for his brother or his neighbor what he loves for himself. Jesus and the lawyer in this moment, they get it. I see you. I feel you. We're good. But here's another beautiful detail in Jesus' response to the lawyer that I didn't catch until reading this yet again to prepare for today's message. When Jesus tells the lawyer what the greatest commandment is, he's quoting what's called the Shema from the Hebrew Scriptures. Yes, from Deuteronomy chapter 6. But when he quotes it, Jesus adds something to it. The Shema says, You shall love God with all your heart, soul, and, mind, and might, or strength. But Jesus adds your mind. You shall love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Why does Jesus add our mind? I guess Jesus was concerned with our minds and rightfully so. If I don't have to think about my faith and how that faith connects me with the world around me, if I don't have to think about how my faith makes how I love God, and how I love my neighbor, inseparable and accountable to one another, then love becomes something to make me feel good about my standing with God and to make me feel justified in the, in, in the occasional charitable act toward my neighbor while remaining indifferent to their lived experience, numb to what they're going through. That is cognitive dissonance. That cognitive dissonance is what so many of us Jesus followers seem to be suffering from today because if every one of us Christians were to stop and think about the state of things, we would see that there's way too much hate and it's going unchecked. If we were to think about how people who differ from the patriarchal, heteronormative, ableist norm are being treated how the social climate is being amped up with hatred against these neighbors of ours, and how that hatred is being used to divide all of us farther and farther from one another and to blind us from each other's humanity, we would realize that this is insane. Have we lost our minds? Where is the love? Saturday a week ago, we are aware of the events that transpired in Pittsburgh that at Tree of Life Synagogue, a man entered that space with a gun in his hand, hate in his heart, and anti-Semitism in his mind. A shooting ensued that would take the lives of 11 people. Now one might say, that's awful, but what does that have to do with us in Brazos County? With us Christians here? And to that thought, Jesus might say the same thing that he said to, to Peter in his moment of self-centeredness, his moment of self-preservation. Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you're setting your mind not on divine things, heavenly things, but on human things. So Thursday night we held a candlelight vigil outside to honor the victims of the shooting in Pittsburgh. Dozens of people from our community showed up. Christians, Jews, Muslims, atheists. Why did everyone come together like that? Why were so many people standing alongside each other across their stereotypical differences like that? A teenager in our youth group summed it up pretty well in the quote that made the cover of Friday's paper. Lucy Harper said, I just want to make sure that our Jewish community in Bryan College Station knows that love is louder than hate. It's a lot easier for events like these mass shootings to make the news and bring everyone down. They're scary and devastating, 
but acts of love don't get the same publicity, she said. It's important to show that love is so much more prevalent. It's everywhere and around all the time. I want everyone to know that and feel that we're good. At the vigil, there were postcards for people to write encouraging notes to the congregation at Tree of Life Synagogue. And a quick note, we have more of those postcards sitting over here on the buffet table for after the service if you want to write some notes to Tree of Life Synagogue's congregation today. I'd encourage you to do that. So I looked at those postcards, because that's what pastors do after you guys take off. <laughs> really uplifting and encouraging, and I wanted to share just a few of them with you. One of the postcards read, I stand with you and love you. I will raise my voice in hope and love to be louder than any voice of hate. Love always wins. It must win. We are one family and our hearts break. I send love, strength, and hope to Pittsburgh and as far as it will reach. Another postcard read, my father passed away earlier this year after a lengthy illness. I mentioned at his memorial service that he would have been deeply concerned at the direction of our country and the rhetoric, and I urged all to speak out against hate, my deepest sympathies. Another one read, sending lots of love and prayers your way, the Muslim community will always be a source of peace and support anywhere and anytime. Stay strong and keep spreading love. Another one read, your pain is my pain, and I stand with you in this time of sorrow. And finally, one just read, I have no words, only love. One of the speakers at the vigil was a friend of ours from Congregation Beth Shalom named Susan Miller. And over the weekend, Susan sent an email to the other speakers who had offered words at the vigil, and this is what she said. I wanted to tell you how much I and the Jewish community appreciated your participation and words of sympathy and solidarity Thursday night. Your actions and words are calling me to make a personal commitment to reach out beyond my community in the future. Shouldn't we all do that? Today we're remembering our saints for All Saints Day. Historically in the Christian tradition, our saints are those people that put love first. We honor them because of their tenacity for love. Honoring them means that we reach out beyond this place to love as they did. In preparation for the vigil, I had a conversation with Susan Miller, and she mentioned this poem by a Lutheran pastor named Martin Niemöller that many of you have heard before. First, they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. Then Susan put it in perspective by saying that there will always be someone who will hate you for some reason. She said, they'll hate you because you're a woman, or because you're a man, or because you're a Muslim, or because you're a Christian, blah, 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 she said. And then we thought about that together. We put our minds to it. If being hated for reasons that are beyond our control is something we all have in common, then loving one another, no matter who we are or where we come from, will liberate us from all forms of hate. Love is all that matters. So as we honor All Saints Day, I invite you to think of the saints in your lives who've taught you to love others with just as much tenacity as we try to love ourselves, no matter who those others are, how they identify, or where they come from. Those saints are the spiritual road signs that God places in our lives to lead us back to the heart of the gospel back to the heart of all that matters, back to the collective art of neighbors shaping our common life together. Thanks be to God. Amen.
We hope you've enjoyed this week's message. I'm Trent Williams, Executive Pastor at Friends Church, and I'd like to welcome you to join us for worship if you're in the area of College Station, Texas, at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. Central Time on Sundays. The 11 a.m. service is also live-streamed on our YouTube channel, Friends Congregational Church, UCC. Our mission is to be united by the example of Jesus, to live faithfully, love limitlessly, and serve boldly. If you would like to support us, we have a Venmo for easy donations of any amount. At Friends UCC, no dashes, no spaces. To find out what's happening in the week ahead at Friends, visit our website, friends-ucc.org, and subscribe to our weekly newsletter by filling out the form at the bottom of the homepage. We will keep you up to date with programs to deepen your spirituality and opportunities to get involved with the church, and we will connect you to acts of service to the wider community. Our worship has ended, and now our service begins. Thank you for listening.